just chapter 10 reading and lectures. So, um, so, so, you know, there's lectures there. And uh, with the chapters 10 and 11, you will see me focusing more on the historical approach. Uh, I think, uh, at least in chapter seven, um, your kind of textbook was also historical, I was historical. In chapters 10 and 11, for whatever reason, your textbook is kind of skipping right to the state of the art as we know it now. And I still think there's some value in um, trying to retrace the steps that people who are first studying these followed. So to that um, point, so your textbook sections 10.1 and 10.2 will cover some topics that will take me quite a bit of time to get to. But I think it's useful for you to read, skim through it. Uh, some of these cover kind of the background material, you know, protons and neutrons. Hopefully you knew that there were those two different kinds of nucleons, particles in the yeah, nucleons, the particles in the atomic nucleus. Um, so hopefully you knew that. If not, this is where you'd learn it. And um, the notation for isotopes, I think I talk about isotopes as I'm talking about radioactive decay. Um, and this is the, I think I do bring this, bring up this chart in the lecture. Um, it, these are kind of useful things to know about uh, as a matter of factoid or trivia about uh, nu um, the, the atomic nucleus. Uh, one interesting thing you see is that the number of protons and number of neutrons kind of tend to equal each other in light uh, stable uh, nucleus. Uh, at this point, you don't really have an explanation why that should be the case, except that it is. Um, and there are obvious exceptions, like a helium-3 is a stable. Uh, helium-5 is not, but helium-3 is a stable, as stable as helium-4. So, um, so um, yeah, child of nuclei. And uh, nuclear physics sometimes it deals with kind of trying to figure out the interaction between um, interaction that describes uh, these different nuclear species. And um, that's kind of what nuclear binding energy gets you into, which um, we more or less skip. We don't really talk about mass defect to you know, read about it so that, you know, one thing I will say is that one model that's sometimes used to model the nuclear energy levels, I think it works especially well for heavier nuclei with the uh, excited energy levels, you can model this actually as a particle in a box, three-dimensional particle in a box that we've been talking about. So, um, but your textbook doesn't get into that and, you know, we are not going to either. So, uh, but binding energy is just to give you some uh, level of expectation that uh, the energy per nucleon is going to vary uh, depending on what nucleus you are dealing with. And this is kind of a useful trivia to know that ion is the most stable nucleus. So when you are uh, following a nuclear reaction chain in like a star, for example, um, so fusion can produce up to iron um, by releasing the additional energy. And if you're wondering how do any elements heavier than iron get produced, they get produced in supernova um, explosions in kind of a non-equilibrium, non-quasi-static, um, um, interaction. So I'll just leave that there, but, um, but yeah, I'll leave it there. Where the lecture will pick up is actually with the section 10.3. That's, uh, uh, we'll start with the nuclear decay and, or sorry, radioactive decay and uh, radioactivity is kind of useful topic to know some things about, especially if you ever work in research setting that works with the radioactivity, because there are some, um, there are some uh, safety things to know. Um, the decay law, this, uh, I do lecture on that. There's uh, this uh, decay constant and uh, this uh, differential expression or differential law that the decay follows. Um, this is, I don't think your textbook really points to this out. Um, one of the implication of something that decays in this form is that these atoms are ageless, as in you cannot take a sample of isotopes, just pure sample of pure isotopes, and know how old they are. 
because whether they have been around for one half lifetime or two half lifetime, this particular sample you have, it will have equal chance of decaying in the next half life. And by the way, we don't really deal with the half life all that much. We deal more with the lifetime that deals with the logo base E. Um, so, so yeah, that exponential decay, that's the common way you see uh, nuclear, the nuclear reaction happen. And this uh, exponential decay form, it's uh, coming from the fact that uh, the, the, the atoms don't retain a memory of how long they have been around. If they did, it could look different. It, it could look more like a human uh, lifetime curve uh, or, yeah. So there's that. And I think this section, oh wait, this is not the section that talks about. So <laughs> what the lecture really gets more into is here, nuclear reactions. I think, uh, yeah, they're gonna talk about alpha rays, beta rays, and gamma rays. Knowing different uh, these uh, different types of uh, radioactive decays and rays that come from the decays. That is one key thing to know about the nuclear reactions. Uh, most uh, importantly, because um, these different types of um, uh, radiation determine what kind of precautions need to be taken. In fact, they were originally categorized by their a penetrating power. And these pictures are kind of giving the, the story away, you know, watch the lecture for um, the discovery of alpha, beta, and gamma and how people figured out what's what. Um, but uh, they were named in the order of their penetrating power. Alpha was the least penetrating. Any kind of barrier would block most of the alphas. Beta was more penetrating, depending on its energy, actually it might be able to go through some thin metals, but at most energies you see, it's blocked by some good thickness of uh, aluminum, for example. Gamma rays are uh, the most penetrating. And in your textbook, uh, they talk about X-rays in chapter eight. Um, and because I kind of skipped section 8.5 in lectures, uh, it's here in lecture, well, I'll, you will see me talk about X-rays in order to compare them to gamma rays. And um, yeah, this is kind of an experimental setup to separate out these different rays. And um, uh, you here in the discussion of alpha, beta, alpha and beta decay especially, you will see conservation laws mentioned. In, uh, in each of these decays, uh, certain numbers are conserved. So in alpha decay, um, the total number of protons and uh, neutrons are conserved. They just get rearranged. Uh, that's what these numbers are showing. And in the beta decay, you will see that, oh, so you will see the mass number conserved. So the sum of uh, protons and neutrons is conserved, but the number of protons is not. Um, it's so that the charge conservation holds. This particular estimate that they are doing, this is a useful estimate to be aware of because this is the best argument to, to say that the electron was not somehow confined within the nucleus. Electron is actually created uh, in the decay of the neutron into proton and electron. So uh, if, if we are trying to argue that all oh, electron was confined, the uncertainty principle tells you that that's not possible. The, these energies are way too high. So, um, so yeah, that uh, section 10.4 is where lecture really gets us started. Then gamma decay is the boringest one. Nothing really changes. It's, uh, it happens when uh, an excited state of nucleus uh, settles into uh, ground state of the nucleus. So uh, gamma decay happens most often alongside other types of decay like alpha and beta. Uh, initial alpha or beta decay might produce a daughter nucleus that's uh, in the excited state. And as it as that uh, settles down further is when you will see gamma decay happen. Um, so yeah, it's uh, um, that and that's kind of the chain of the decay chains, you know, I think this is alpha, beta, alpha, alpha, alpha. And uh, all the elements heavier than lead is 
um, is unstable and they will all have a chain um, to decay into either lead or something lighter than lead uh, over long enough for a period of time. And where the lecture ends with is with a discussion of fission and fission as a kind of an excited or a stimulated reaction. Um, these nuclear reactions we've been talking about so far, you could talk about it as a spontaneous reaction. There's frankly nothing we can do to affect them. There's going to happen whatever. I think if you apply a strong electric field, sometimes that modifies the rates a little bit, but not much. Fission is where we stimulate, cause the nuclear reaction to happen by bombarding a particular a certain types of species of nuclei with a neutron. That um, so this is a reaction fission reaction doesn't happen with every type of nucleus, um, every type of isotopes. Uh, there are certain isotopes with which that happens. Uranium two thirty five is one of them. <laughs> That's why they are used in uh, nuclear reactors and atomic bombs. And plutonium two thirty nine is another one. Um, and so, so, so it is, it's the discretion of the fission reaction, and this is kind of the schematic model of how it's happening. Uranium-236 is not something you ever see. Um, the, this time in which this um, impacted the isotope decays into daughter nuclei, it, it's very quick, like immeasurably quick. And, um, Fission, the type of fission reaction you see in either a nuclear reactor or in a nuclear bomb is a chain reaction. And the important element of the chain reaction is that each of these fission reaction should produce neutrons that are, uh, that are more than what you put in. And uh, this is where the concept of critical mass comes in as well, because each of these neutrons needed to have a decent chance of interacting with uh, another. A fissile atom. So, um, so there's a good simulation to kind of illustrate that. Um, I think this is the simulation, and uh, you will see me use this simulation to illustrate uh, the kind of fist or critical mass arrangement, and uh, you'll see that. And so, this is where the lecture ends at. And in terms of your assignment, you won't see sections 10.6 or 10.7 covered. 10.7 to some degree. I think I did give the radiation safety talk, but uh, not to this, not to the detail your section 10.7 does. So I think to a great deal, um, this part, I mentioned this a little bit, but not again to this detail. So read it for your own good. <laughs> but. Um, it's not like in my, there's not going to be a homework question asking something about Sievert and Rontgen equivalent, man, like this, no. Um, but it's uh, something like this is good to, good to know because uh, when you think about sources of radiation, uh, there are actually a lot of natural sources of radiation. Like uh, these are natural sources of radiation that you can't get away from anywhere in on earth or out of earth. And um, it's really uh, the radiation exposures above and beyond the natural background that we are, norm the people who are concerned with the radiation safety are concerned with. So, so read about that in section 10.7, but again, not that many uh, questions. And section 10.6, so even though, so you won't have any homework questions on this. And I really did want to cover this, I just, uh, ran out of time in the previous semesters. I'll try to find the time to lecture on nuclear fusion. Some of the things that are examples of nuclear fusion reaction. And um, I guess <laughs> the only practical application of nuclear fusion that exists outside of the sun, which is the, uh, the thermonuclear bomb or the hydrogen bomb. So you can also read about that on your own here. And I'll try to find the time to um, a lecture on this. Uh, this is kind of the research uh, thing that does not produce net energy yet. Nuclear fusion, the practical, peaceful power generation of nuclear fusion has been, it seems like it's been 20 years away forever. So who knows?
uh, when, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave that there. So, uh, so that's a kind of overview of chapter 10. Um, and I think as I mentioned earlier, as we were starting with uh, chapter eight and on, uh, from here on our coverage of the topics will be necessarily more conceptual and less uh, detailed quantitative. That's um, kind of more of a survey of topics than detailed um, dive into nuclear physics or later particle physics. So, um, so, so skim through all the sections and let me know if any questions. <laughs>